So hello, everybody. It's great to see familiar faces, some new faces. It's really nice to be able to be here and to be in this really special time. This is a really special time of the year, a time that we don't have this. If we wanted to just decide to forgive someone or to let go on a regular Tuesday during the year, that would be great, but we don't have this extra energy. There's something very special that in the Jewish calendar, there's different seasons for different things. And this is a season for forgiveness. And so I wanna capture that. I wanna capture that energy, capture that feeling with you tonight and try somehow to, with a mix of inspiration and practical advice, I like to see if we can, by capturing that energy to really be able to focus on something really special and move forward and go into this brand new year of five, seven, eight, two, with something really, really special and something really beautiful. I have a rabbinic colleague and he claims that he begins the Kol Nidre service, his Yom Kippur service, which is happening this Wednesday night, every year by saying to his congregation, if I have done anything in the past that disappointed or offended any of you, you're probably just too sensitive. That's what I call a rabbinic apology. A man, uh, a man once had too much to drink at a party and he made a fool of himself and then he passed out. Friends helped his wife take him home and the next morning he was remorseful. He was feeling bad about what happened and he asked his wife to forgive him and she agreed to forgive him and to forget the incident completely. Maybe this story hits home for some of you, I don't know. As months went by, his wife referred to the incident from time to time and always with a, a little note of ridicule, a little scorn in her voice. Finally, the man was fed up with being reminded about his bad behavior. And he said, I thought you were gonna forgive and forget. She said, I, I, I have forgiven and forgotten, but I don't want you to forget that I forgave and forgot. I think that we've all been hurt. We've all been offended, betrayed, mistreated at some point in our lives. It's natural. It's natural to cling to our resentments. We might get this strange sense of satisfaction in clinging to our resentments. Maybe something happened to you when you were younger. Someone wronged you. Maybe someone lied about you or someone cheated you. Maybe a good friend betrayed you and you have a reason, a really legitimate reason to be angry, to be bitter. I do. But what I'm gonna ask you tonight is for your emotional and for your spiritual health, this is a very special time. It's a special time on the calendar and I'm asking you to choose, to choose to forgive. Forgiveness doesn't require that you approve of someone else's outrageous behavior. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you're gonna subject yourself to it again. It just means letting go of your resentment, letting go of your anger. If you 
attempt to bury the hurt in your heart, it's gonna seep out and it's gonna end up contaminating your character. It'll contaminate your behavior, your life. True freedom begins when we can release the burden of our resentment. I'm gonna say that again. If you wanna be free, if you want to experience freedom in your life, we need to release the burden. It's like a jail. That's what resentment is. So if you care about yourself first, then you'll care enough to forgive. Harboring grudges poisons life in the same way that other toxins do. A few decades ago, there were several American companies that secretly buried toxic waste products underground. They, they filled large metal containers with poisonous chemicals. They sealed the drums tightly and they buried them deep below the topsoil. And they thought this was the end of it. But soon many of the containers they had buried, they began to crack. They began to leak and the toxic waste started seeping to the surface. And in some of the locations, locations it filled up. It started killing off vegetation. It started ruining the water supply and people had to move out of their homes in one section near Niagara Falls, it's actually known as the Love Canal, many people began dying from debilitating diseases because of it. What went wrong? What happened? What did they do? They tried to bury something that was too toxic. They thought they could be rid of it once and for all, but they didn't realize that the materials were so powerful that they were too toxic for the containers to hold. They never dreamed that, that one day these contaminants would resurface and they would kill people. And had they have disposed of them properly, a terrible tragedy could have been averted. I think this is a great analogy to holding on to something that's too toxic. It's the same thing with you and I. When someone hurts us, when, when someone does us wrong, instead of letting it go and trusting God to make it up to us, we end up burying it deep inside. We attempt to cram unforgiveness we cram resentment, anger, and all these other destructive responses into what I'm going to call our leak-proof containers. And we seal those lids tightly, and then we say, good, I'm going to have to deal with that never again. I'm rid of it once and for all. But just as toxic waste tends to resurface, the things that we cram into our subconscious, the things that are buried deep in our heart will rise to the surface and they will contaminate our life. We can't live with poison inside of us and not expect that eventually that poison will harm us. I know it's hard to accept sometimes, but we can't live with poison inside of us and expect that eventually it's not gonna harm us. I wanna tell you a story from the greatest book ever written. Some people call it the Bible. I'm gonna call it the Torah. Best selling book of all time. More languages, more copies have sold of this book than any other. You can find it even in just about every hotel room in the world. And I think that this story that I'm gonna tell you from the good book 
is what I think is the saddest love story in the entire Torah. It's chapter six of the book of Samuel. It describes what should have been the happiest day in King David's life. King David, the great King David, he has united the northern and southern tribes of Israel. And now, for the first time in a while, there is a single unified Jewish nation. It's a beautiful moment. This is the beginning of what will be the ancient Jewish empire. He has conquered Jerusalem. He's made Jerusalem Israel's capital. He's setting down stones that you and I can touch today. The same stones of King David, the great Jerusalem stones. And as the centerpiece of his efforts, he's arranged to bring the Ark of Covenant, the great Aaron, the Ark into its permanent home in Jerusalem. And there's great celebration. There's great moment, this is finally gonna happen. You see, many years earlier, the Philistines had captured it. And now that the Ark, the Aron is gonna return, it's gonna serve as the ultimate glorious symbol in the Jewish people's triumph. It would be a parade, the likes on which no one had ever seen. This procession with the Ark, with the Aron, includes singing and dancing. And King David enthusiastically joins in the dancing. The king himself is dancing with everyone else. David's wife, her name is Michal, and she is the daughter of the previous king, the great King Saul. And she watches from a palace window and is disgusted when she sees that her husband, David, is dancing wildly in the streets. And he comes in and he's exuberant, he's ecstatic. And Michal greets him with a torrent of sarcasm. She says, well, Mr. King of Israel, you're a real class act, aren't you? Jumping in public like a peasant street dancer? The implication is, she says, I didn't grow up on a farm shooting coyotes with a slingshot like you. I grew up in the palace and I know something about how kings, she says, are supposed to behave. You, David, are undignified. You are an embarrassment. Kings are supposed to act like kings. This chapter in Samuel continues telling the story, saying that David is, is deeply hurt by her disapproval, which spoils this beautiful day of celebration for him. And he strikes back at her when she's most vulnerable, saying, I was dancing before God, but, but he's so hurt, he's so upset that he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say that he was dancing before God who rejected her father and made David king in his place. I am dancing before the God that rejected your father. And now I'm the king. And the chapter concludes with these poignant words. And I'll say them in Hebrew and I'll translate them for you right after. Ulemichal bat Shaul lo haya la yeled ad yom mosa. Michal, it says, daughter of Saul never had a child to the day she died. Basically what it's saying 
is that Michal never approached David. They were never intimate as husband and wife after that argument. A, a, a flip comment led to a permanent and, and bitter separation. I don't know about you, but I find that sad. Here, here are two people who once loved each other so much that they risked their lives for each other. I'll tell you that story a different time. I mean, David fought in one-on-one -on -one battles with many Philistines to win Michal's hand in marriage. And when Michal's father, who was afraid that David would usurp the throne, he was going to usurp the throne, he plotted to kill him. And she put her life in jeopardy, helping David escape hired assassins. What happened to all that love? One argument? One set of angry words can destroy that level of love to people who physically, literally fought for one another? Doesn't make any sense to me. I'll explain it to you, because I've thought about this. I think what destroyed their love was the fact that when David and Michal woke up the next morning, they didn't forgive each other. They could have had a conversation. They could have had a conversation infused with empathy, infused with reconciliation. Instead, the, the resentment lingered and contaminated their relationship. Resentment destroys love. Resentment destroys relationships. It spreads quickly and destroys life. The Torah's point is as clear as today as it was thousands of years ago. If a husband or wife or two siblings or friends or sisters carry resentment, if they don't forgive each other, love is unlikely to survive. No matter how deeply the two people once cared for each other. It's hard, it's hard to accept, but that's what it is. The Hebrew word for forgiveness is mechila. Mechila, like M-E-C-H-I-L-A, mechila. We say it over and over again in the Yom Kippur prayers. But what's interesting about the word mechila, which is forgiveness, it's related to the word macho, to dance, to dance in a circle. So what is the connection between a circle formed in a dance and forgiveness? I've thought about this too. And I think that we're all part of the circle of life. We're part of the dance. Maybe the Jewish dance, the Jewish dance that stretches across history, a brilliant and vivid choreography. When I remain angry at a member of my family, when I remain angry at a member of my community, when I refuse to forgive you, I push you out of the circle of belonging. When you remain angry at me and you refuse to, give, to forgive me, you push me out of that circle. We are no longer moving in unison. When we carry grudges, when we carry hate, when we carry negative energy, we can't dance. Think of it like the circulation in the body. The heart circulates the blood through the body thousands of times each day, transporting oxygen, transporting nutrients that are vital for health. 
What happens if, heaven forbid, there's a clot? The blood isn't allowed to dance through the body. God is the heart of the Jewish people. It's the heart of our soul. And every single one of us is a limb. And when you block a limb, when you create a clot, the dance is diminished. The movement is compromised because everyone has a blessing to give. We're forfeiting our grace and energy by holding that resentment. When I grant others forgiveness, what ends up happening is we join in a dance of reconnection. When I let go of ill feelings, when I let go of anger, the obstacle to the flow of the circle is removed and then we can dance together in happiness. We're just a few days from Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, the day of Mechila, the day of forgiveness. It's time to dance. It's time to dance with each other and to dance with God. And so my wish, all of our wish, is that we have the courage to forgive the people who have hurt us, to forgive the spouse who did you wrong, to forgive the friends who betrayed you, to forgive the parents who mistreated you when you were younger, to get rid of all that poison today so that we can enter Yom Kippur with an empty bag and say, here, God, now, dear God, I have forgiven others, which means I can be forgiven. How do we expect God to be able to forgive us on the day of Yom Kippur if we haven't forgiven others? Essentially, we're doing God's work. God is the one who forgives. So I ask you tonight, don't let the bitterness continue to contaminate your life. I ask you tonight to join me in this dance of forgiveness. I know I speak good words. It sounds great, but it's difficult. There's real stuff. We have real issues. For many of us, it's not easy to let go of grievances. We need Festivus for that for the airing of grievances. It's not easy to forgive the offender. How do we forgive? How do we actually let go of hurt and anger? So what I wanna to do tonight, because I promised you something practical, is I wanna give you five strategies that I personally find helpful to get rid of resentment. Here are my Five strategies, which by the way, the reason why I'm giving you five is because Yom Kippur is all about five. There's five things that we don't do on Yom Kippur that we refrain from. There's five prayers. There's five levels of the soul. We'll talk about this in a different Kabbalah class, but the, the fifth level of the soul, which is called Yechida, can only be accessed in Yom Kippur. There's a lot of fives. So I decided that I'm gonna give you another five. The five strategies to help you forgive. Number one, and they don't go backwards, they go forwards. Or usually you do the top five or a top 10, they go starting from 10. No, I'm gonna start from one. Number one, reflect on a troubled life on the difficulties of the one who offended you. Imagine this. Imagine your way into their experience. You're walking in their shoes. You're looking at the world through their perspective. Consider their psychological problems. Consider the abuse they may have experienced. 
Consider the addiction they may suffer from and ask yourself whether those factors might have contributed to the evil they did to you. Now, I'm gonna tell you, those factors don't exonerate their behavior. But it's not about them, it's about you. You're the one forgiving, not them. I mean, they should also do their own thing, but we're talking about you and I here. So we're not saying it's gonna exonerate their behavior, but thinking about them with empathy will make it easier for you to forgive them. Understanding can often be the catalyst for forgiveness. So my number one is think of the person who did wrong to you with empathy. However it is, if you need to create a narrative or however you need to do that, start off by looking at the world through their eyes and really come to experience the emotional feeling of empathy towards them. That's one. Number two, consider the whole person. Don't fixate on the behavior, fixate on the person. Remember the kindnesses that the offender may have done for you or may have done for others, not just the mistakes they made. We often focus on the behavior instead of the person. Try to separate the bad they did to you from who they are as a person. Two best friends once got into a fight and in the heat of the moment, one deeply insulted the other. The man who received the insult said nothing, but he wrote in the sand, today, my best friend hurt me terribly. Days later, the man who had been hurt was pinned under a fallen horse. His friend pulled him out and sped him to a doctor. This time, the injured man carved into stone. Today, my best friend saved my life. That's a wise way to handle an insult. Record it lightly. Record it in the sand where the winds of forgiveness can erase it. But the kindnesses that we receive, engrave them permanently. Recall them often. Focus on the whole person and that will help you forgive them. So often in our society, we have been conditioned to focus on the negative. Look at the whole person. Focus on the positive. Number three. Think about any unintended good that resulted from the wrong that was done to you. When others hurt us, it often pushes us to grow in ways that we would have not grown otherwise. As hard as it is to see sometimes, pain can be for the best. Obstacles can make us stronger and defeats can prepare the way for future victories. So if you find it tough to forgive someone, especially someone who has asked for forgiveness, see whether you can find any personal growth or other good that resulted because of what happened. And on the basis of that, find it in your heart to forgive the person who hurt you. And your strength can be the basis for the forgiveness. There's so many things that happen as a result of two people having a particular experience, whether good or bad. So see, see whether you can find any personal growth, any good that resulted as a result of what happened. Number four, this entire process, this entire strategy 
It only works if you believe in God. When the person who hurt you asks for forgiveness and gives you confidence that they're not going to repeat their bad behavior in the future, you should accept their apology and offer them a wholehearted forgiveness. And you're gonna ask me why, I'll tell you. Because people have the ability to change. People have the ability to improve and to grow. To ignore the possibility that people can change is the essence of atheism. Human beings are made in God's image. So to denigrate people and to deny their ability to change is to denigrate and deny God. So if you're an atheist, don't forgive. You're going to hell anyway. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But if you're a believer, try to forgive. We owe the offender the opportunity to demonstrate that this person is a different person today than they were last month. We owe them the ability to show that they have the ability to change. It matters to God how we treat them because we all bear God's image. In the eyes of God, we're all precious. And so remember this. If you remember one thing tonight, remember this. God forgives those who themselves forgive others. God forgives those who themselves forgive others. And now the fifth. Number five, this strategy is morally courageous. It's not always applicable, but I'm going to share it because I love it. In the 11th century, there was a great scholar named Rabbi Shmuel Hanagid. Shmuel was the prime minister to the king of Spain. The king of Spain held him of high regard. And among the nobles, many of them were jealous that the king had appointed a Jew to this high in office. And they kept trying to besmirch him. One day, the king went with the Shmuel on a tour of the city. As they were walking, a shopkeeper stormed out of his store and shouted, humiliating insults at Rabbi Shmuel. Shmuel paid no attention to the nasty language, but the king was enraged. Remember, this was a barbaric age. And he said to Shmuel, arrest that man and cut out that vile tongue. Rabbi Shmuel inquired about the man, and he actually found out that he was impoverished. He couldn't support his family. And he started to send the man money in regular installments. Sometime later, the king and Rabbi Shmuel were out in the city again. And they came across the same man who greeted Shmuel with lavish praise. The king looks at Rabbi Shmuel and says, didn't I tell you to have this man's tongue cut out? Rabbi Shmuel smiles and he says, your majesty, that's exactly what I did. I removed his vile tongue and replaced it with a noble one. I think this is a wonderful way to respond to people who hurt us, to help them. Our resentment over the offender's sin will melt away and will be replaced by love. So I, I give you five strategies tonight. Number one, reflect on the troubled life of the offender. Number two, focus not 
just on their evil, but also on their kindness. Number three, consider the unintended good that resulted. Number four, remember that the person has the ability to change. And finally, number five, consider cutting out their vile tongue and replacing it with a noble one. Let go of hurt by helping the offender. I really hope that these strategies are practical for you. For forgive. Forgiveness. However hard it is, we forgive at the end of the day because that's what God does for us. God forgives us. Forgive because schlepping resentments is like getting up every morning and filling a big wheelbarrow with old garbage and bringing it into the new day. Tonight, I called it let it go because that's what we have to do. We have to take that wheelbarrow and just let it all go, throw out the garbage. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you probably remember that the southern gate of the old city is the one that's closest to the Kotel. It's known as the Lion's Gate. It used to have another name actually. It was called Sha'ar, anyone know Ha'ashpot? The Dung Gate or the, the Gate of Dirt. And the reason for that name is that for centuries, Jewish pilgrims came to Jerusalem from around the world to pray at the Kotel. They came on foot across the desert. And by the time they reached the gates of the city, their feet were covered in mud and dirt. They didn't want to defile the Temple Mount by entering the city in that condition. So they washed all the mud, all the filth off their feet at the Southern Gate. And so here we are. I think we're at the Dung Gate, the Lion's Gate, the Dirt Gate. This is the moment that we're at tonight, getting ready for Yom Kippur. We stand at the gate that leads us into being sealed for a beautiful new year, a new year that, my God, we need more than ever before after the year that we've been through. And this new year, we want to enter it clean, we want to enter it pure. And so we ask God to forgive us. And we ask God to help us forgive others. And we ask God to wash off those resentments, to wash off those grudges, to wash off the lingering anger. And as they melt away, may we dance the dance of forgiveness May we dance through that gate as one people into one beautiful, sweet new year. And that, my friends, is my talk for the formal part of our discussion tonight. Now I'd love to go um, answer questions and then go into the informal part, but I'm going to turn off the recording.